Uh, our first speaker is Professor George Enake uh, from uh, the uh, University Dunarea. Uh, Lower Danube University of Galat, translated in English. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, he is the professor of philosophy. Uh, uh, he, he, he is a professor at the, at the Faculty of History, Philosophy and Theology, and his main field of interest uh, are communism, church history. Uh, so the floor is yours. Yes, communism and me. So, thank you. First of all, I may, I might say, but it's quite difficult for me to speak just after lunch. <laughs> In uh, the Balkan countries, it's time for siesta, not for fiesta. <laughs> but uh, because we're dealing with uh, intellectual fiesta, let's go on. Fiesta must go on with me or with the other uh, people. Um, historians used to write many pages, so my presentation is quite long. So, for this reason, uh, my presentation has also three parts, has all part, three parts, and I will read only the last part, the third part of my presentation. So, I'll present very fast the conclusion of the uh, first two parts, because they are very important for to understand the third part. So, this is the key idea, the Romanian Orthodox, it was a historical approach. The Romanian Orthodoxy has not had a canonization policy like other churches. The first canonization of the Romanian Orthodox Church happened in 1950. And this is truly important. Truly imp uh, the popular religiousness equates saints with monk. The judgment criteria for a saint being the power to pray, to pray not pray, was a mistake here, as it is, <laughs> and the ability to work miracles. It's uh, about uh, the saints as a wonder worker, yes? And uh, this idea, which is uh, very present in another traditions in Eastern Europe, the connection between holiness and the destiny of a people appears relatively late and only in certain social circles. So for the majority of uh, Orthodox believers in Romania, the idea of a saint is connected to the idea to be a monk. Yes, so. Uh, was a great, a great problem to understand this idea of a martyr for the faith and to, f to fighting against communism. So, was another chapter uh, entitled, so to point it, the communist regime and the attempt to modify the memory of the church. And the main conclusion of this chapter are, in the communist period, the Orthodox Church played what seems to be an ambiguous role of a victim but at the same time, a collaborator of a communist regime, which fact which influences the way in which the martyrdom idea was managed. The martyrs of the Romanian Orthodox Church in the communist period come from among the priests, the monks, but also from among the laymen, intellectuals, people who are part of armed resistance against the regime. So, the phenomenon of finding God in prison is highly present in Romania. Part of us, the rest of our members, that's another important idea. Part of us, the rest of our members and supporters of a legionary movement, a fascist movement, which mixed the ideology of the orthodoxy. Being considered mystics, they received in communist prison a special re-education, which in fact strengthened their faith in God. I wrote an article about this category of mystics and mysticism in the communist times and uh, how the communist regime used this category of, mixti of mystics to, uh, to mix, yeah, mystics to mix uh, the religions with politics and to send to prison a lot of priests, a lot of monks who, who were accused about the, uh, our political activities. So it's uh, very important, but we don't have time to talk too much about this, uh, this uh, notion. So I'm going back to the third part of my presentation, which is entitled Dealing with the Past, Communist Past on the, of the Romanian Orthodox Church after 1989. So you have a similar image as you, see, as you have seen uh, in the presentation before the lunch. Yes, it's a tree of Romanian saints, of new Romanian saints. 
Yes? After the fall of the communist regime in Romania in 1989, the religious cult took advantage of the freedom they obtained and asked to play a greater role in the social space as they used to do before communism. Numerous churches were built, religious was reintroduced as a subject in school. Uh, after the years of official atheism, the, this comeback seemed during the first, uh, first post-communist decade natural. Later, Romania witnessed it under the influence of ideological currents coming from the West, the appearance of a certain opinion that considered the presence of a church in the public space as exaggerated, asking for a new secularization. Being the most important religious domination in, uh, denomination in Romania, with the largest public exposure, the Romanian Orthodox Church became the favorite target of attacks. Besides the classical accusation brought against the Christian churches nowadays, one of the major accusations referred to the way the Romanian Orthodox Church behaved during communism. The main point of the discourse was the fact that the Orthodox Church was essentially has essentially an anti-democratic ideology, displaying the propensity for a relationship with undemocratic, even totalitarian regimes. Before 1944, the Orthodox Church would have allegedly supported the legionary movement, although it was a fascist movement, while during the communist period, the church would have made a pact of compromise with the regime, becoming as a result a beneficiary of many privileges. The accusation coming from the secular side combined with those coming from some religious, de from some religious denomination. After 1989, the Greek Catholic Church, forbidden in the communist era, was recognized again. The Greek Catholic leaders set the goal of recovering all believers they used to have before 1948, as well as their assets. As the Greek Catholics Catholic worshiping plagues had become the property of Orthodox Church, a fought battle started between the two denominations, which manifested on the symbolic level as well. The Greek Catholic Church was coming with the aura of a martyr church, all its bishops having been sent to prison. You can see here the image of a bishop of a Greek Catholic Church from Romania, which soon will be proclaimed saints by the uh, Holy See. Canonization files were set for the bishop that had died in the communist prison. On the other side, the Orthodox hierarchy reacted unconvincingly. Beside the attacks from the secular zone over dispute with other denomination, there were disputes at the very heart of Orthodox Church regarding the way in which the communist past should be perceived, with voices that distinguished between those men of the church who confessed Christ, even with the price of their lives, and the church hierarchy that preferred to compromise with the regime. Moreover, due to the action of a securitate, the former secret police of Romanian communist state, decade after decade, there were misunderstandings given among those who had suffered for their faith. That interesting thing, the people who suffered had the, uh, had conflicts uh, among them, and there is a conflict among the people who suffered uh, in the prisons. All this conglomerate of factors considerably complicated the discussion about the communist past of the church and the potential issue of canonizing the church martyrs from the communist period. In these disputes, persons within the Orthodox Church, now for, known for their criticizing attitude towards the communist regime, and here is the case of a famous pre-priest, Gheorghe Calciu Dumitrasa. He was a decent during the 80s, and uh, he was expelled from Romania. And here you can see him with the president, uh, Ronald Reagan, yes, at Washington. Insisted on the idea of church unity, avoiding the appearance of some schism, as it happened in other Orthodox churches, for example, the case of the Bulgarian case. However, it was clear that the issue of the communist past could no longer be ignored or discussed in general terms. Everybody suffered, this is the general terms. It was necessary that the names, names of those who had suffered for their faith in the communist period to appear clear, clear, clearly in the public space. Immediately after the revolution in 1989, former political prisoners st started to have a systematic activity of presenting the suffering they had to experience in the communist prison and building monuments in honor to, uh, to honor those who had died in communist detention. Even a magazine appeared, Memoria, and this is 
uh, the journal. It's the first uh, journal about the uh, prison, the political prisons in Romania during the communist regime. Uh, the next step was to write systematic studies about the Orthodox clerics who had suffered in the communist dungeons, the first major study of this kind being the imprisonment church. Yes, it was also translated into English, yes. Made by the National Institute of Studying Totalitarianism under the edges of Romanian Academy. After the former Securitate Archives has been opened for research, these studies have become more rigorous and at present we have precise data about 2,000 Orthodox preach who went through the communist preach the prison out of total of 10,000 prints that were in the Romanian Orthodox Church at the middle of the 20th century. The first study that was officially assumed by the Romanian Orthodox Church on the topic of communist prison, Martyr Dom, was published as late as 2007, being not an Orthodox initiative, but one of a German Christian foundation, St. Gerhard which invited all denominations in Romania to make a common martyrology of a victim of communism. The German side supported the cost. The project was eventually finalized, but without the participation of the Greek Catholic Church, we had some difference with a representative of the Romanian Orthodox Church. Um, in the same year, 2007, under the edges of the Romanian Patriarchy, a committee of studying the history of the Romanian Orthodox Church during the communist period was established. Its purpose being to clarify the disputed historic aspects. The committee was supposed to do only historic research, but because of its activity, it was also expected to provide some names of people who had suffered for Christ to be proclaimed holy martyrs of the church. From this very point of view, the expectations were higher and higher. Different organizations appeared, foundations that were published in magazine or a making website, which were compiled a list of possible saints discussing the issue of a Christian martyrdom and wondering when the church hierarchy would decide to canonize those that started to be called the prison saints. The most ambitious project along this line was in Ayud. No, yes. Many people were sent to a youth prison, most of them being connected to the legionary movement. They had a special propensity for faith and displayed a remarkable collective solidarity. Here we, uh, we see some young people, as Valeru Gafencu, this is Valeru Gafencu, who choose to experience in prison an authentic Christian existence, perceiving sufferance as an opportunity for redemption. The extraordinary force of these people's faith is highlighted by the writings of Ioan Ianolide, the other guy, a former political prisoner who considered himself apprentice of Gafencu. And he published after 1989 under the, uh, a book entitled The Return, Return to Christ. Uh, the same circle saw the movements of a young man uh, who later became a monk, and after 1989, would establish in, uh, who established in his native village, Petru Voda, a monastery, who has become a center of promoting the idea of prison saints. His name was Justin Purvu. This is the book of Ioan Ianolide, Return to Christ, yes. And this is Father Justin Purvu, who was also an apprentice of uh, Valeriu Gafencu. Justin Burfu became a famous monk in Romania due, he, due, due to his ascetism and the fact that he would speak with believers for hours on end. Regular people, normal people, perceive him in a way familiar to them as an abbot. And uh, his discourse about uh, the prison saints was highly ignored. So he was in prison. He talked many times about the, prison, uh, the people in prison, the prison saints. Uh, many people used to come at this, his monastery, but they actually ignore completely uh, this aspect, this dimension of his, of his speech. Uh, I ask one, one of his people, why are you going to the monastery and talk with this, uh, uh, this uh, monk? They just say, it, uh, they have, uh, they, they, he spent a lot of time with, uh, with us, he listened to us, and he's a wonder worker. So uh, absolutely no connection with the idea of prison saints. Uh, one of his supporters, 
was the actual Dampuri well now especially for his pantomime shows, but also started to hold conference about the destiny of the Romanian people and about the prison saints, which enjoyed an immense success, but it's an intellectual milieu. I would say this is Dan Puric and his conference, you can see a high number of people who, who listen to him. Um, uh, which his discourse about the prison saints who recover the dignity of the Romanian people through their sacrifice was embraced particularly by a cultivated social stratum who supported Father Justin in his action. Uh, so it's uh, him. Um, so. Um, uh, I passed uh, lit, uh, some uh, ideas. The money generated by the Dampuri conferences and the book that Dampuri wrote, books that Dampuri wrote, would be used to build a memorial in Ayud. In Ayud, there is a place called Reparobilor, the slave's ravine, where the dead of Ayud prison were animosely buried. After there, after 1989, former political prisoners, prisoners built a monument that displayed several crosses, signifying the prisoners, carrying a larger cross of their shoulders. It was built in 1995, author is Angel Marco. The significance was obvious. The sufferance in prison was equivalent with carrying Christ's cross, action that would sanctify the one assuming such a burden. As the old, abandoned cemetery keep prevailing bones, the latter was stored in a room at the base, at the basis of a memorial. It's some here, other relics based. Starting to be worshipped as relics, even if nobody knew who they sued to belong, and there was no recognition on behalf of a church leadership. There's another dimension of tradition in Orthodox Church, this uh, celebration and the worship of relics, yes? And they, find that they found these relics in the cemetery and they began to worship them. It was considered that those bonds has been sanctified through the suffering endured in prison. Father Justin wanted to build a monastery next to this monument where the dead could be forever remembered. His project met Father Kirilla, project, a Christian-oriented doc doctor, who wanted to build in Ayud a center of martyrdom studies. This is uh, the chapel with a memorial with a bones from the cemetery, yes. And <laughs> they are worshiped, they are considered as relics. This is Pavel Kirilla, yes. And he wrote a, a book about the principle of uh, martyrologic researches. And here is the uh, project of uh, the new monastery of Ayud. The results of the encounter of these two ideas was an absolutely remarkable project belonging to architect Radu Mikhailescu, who suggested a memorial church full of symbolism with the altar, altar table struck into the ground where the martyrs are buried, the center of martyrdom studies being harmoniously integrating with the ensemble. This is the church, yes. This is the center, okay. This is the center of martyrological studies. And uh, uh, anyway, the project is absolutely remarkable. But uh, what happened, and this is very important, uh, the construction of a memorial with a monastery regime was approved by the local bishop. But shortly after this, some rivalries appeared, some kind of battle over the saints, which led to this cause. So today we have a huge debate about this project. We are different uh, people involved in these fights. And so uh, up today, the discussion about the, uh, the prison saints and this project is suspended. So uh, to end my presentation, in 2017, Patriarch Daniel uh, proclaimed, we have uh, such tradition, Orthodox, present Orthodox Church, every year it's a reverential year. So the year of 2017 was the reverential year of Patriarch Justinian and the defenders of Orthodox during the communist regime. Why? Because Patriarch Justinian ruled the Orthodox Church during the first part of the communist regime. And during this uh, year was created this image. You see, Patriarch outside 
and behind the bars, the prison saints, yes? Significance the idea of a unit of a church, even they were outside or the inside in prison, yes? So it was another idea, another topic of the unity of the church. They suffered together, even they were outside and or in, inside of a prison. And the idea, the entire communist regime was actually a prison. Yes, and as a conclusion, until now, we don't have in Romania, no one was, uh, no one, uh, no one, no one prison saint was actually uh, canonized officially by the, uh, by the church. But we have just one case in discussion. And this case is of this person, Arsenie Boca, yes, which is very famous at his, grave uh, in Transylvania. You can see every, say every week a lot of crowd who worship the grave, yes? And uh, he also was a prison, political prison, but the reason which is so cherished by the people is actually he, uh, a free reason. He is a monk, he was a monk. He is considered as a wonder worker and he was a mystic. So that's the reason the image in the people and the people consider him as saints, not because he was in the prison, but just because he uh, is the true image of a monk, of the ideal type uh, of, a, of a monk. Thank you and sorry because I uh, trespassed the time. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you were exactly on time, so thank yes. you very much. Yes, I said. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Katarzyna Korzeniowska from Witold Pilecki Center for Totalitarian Studies. Uh, she holds a PhD in sociology, and she is an independent editor, researcher, and translator. Uh, she published articles in Polish and Lithuanian, uh, mainly on the relation between national and religious aspects in contemporary history of Lithuania. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, um, as the time passes, um, uh, the situation changes also. And uh, I must uh, just correct, to be correct, that I am not anymore um, uh, in collaboration with the Center uh, of Totalitarian Studies. And even more, this very center uh, does not exist. It <laughs> transformed into some other center, so just to there are many historians maybe here and they like the historical truth, so I, I want just to keep up to the okay. facts. <laughs> but that, everything is okay and, and it is not, uh, it is not uh, fundamental, at least for the topic I'm going to present. And uh, of course, first of all, I would like to, uh, to say thank you to the, the Center for European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity. Um, it is always important for the independent scholar to be invited and to, to have an opportunity to do for the participation in, in academic community. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, moving to the um, topic itself, um, I'm going to, to speak about two uh, uh, personalities, St. Casimirus and more broadly about uh, uh, blessed uh, Theophilus Matulonius, not signed yet, uh, but uh, he fills in or falls in the, the the notion of the of the sanctity, I believe. Uh, and I will I will try to show um, a sort of uh, transformation in Lithuanian mentality and Lithuanian memory. Uh, uh, and the process when the Lithuanians uh, once have chosen the saint that is heroic and uh, uh, respected for his military virtues and now they are more prompt to worship someone who, who mostly suffered. I don't know whether it's visible. Uh, those two pictures represent St. Casimiros uh, on the, or St. Casimir, a different pronunciation. The patron, official patron of Lithuania, this picture is from 
it is a graphic of se uh, 17th century. This is more modern. It is uh, from interwar period. And um, um, uh, I would probably should explain this interconnection between a hero and a patron. Those who have had an opportunity in their life to follow any course of introduction for, uh, into Polish sociology probably remember Czarnowski, Stefan Czarnowski, and his study on Saint's National Hero. hero. It was written in French. Uh, next year it will be 100 year after, after French publication. Uh, in English it was probably be like the cult of the heroes and its uh, social preconditions. St. Patrick as a hero, national hero of, of uh, the island. And really, um, it is not classical. It is as simple as the PhD in sociology can be. Still, um, I will take this, uh, well, not theory, it is an example to follow, because um, to follow in the studies, in the practice of research. Because I believe this motif of um, the saint the national hero connected or mixed up into one is somehow uh, underestimated, although very characteristic for many uh, uh, countries, particularly in our, era, in our region. And what Czarnowski says, who is this hero, a hero and a patron, a hero national sign? Um, it is very easy, it, is, it should be human, not any mythological being or whatever. Uh, it should represent or incarnate the important values that the community shares, and it should be considered one of us. So very simple definition, and for uh, almost 300 years, St. Casimirus uh, incarnated those values like freedom or independence or um, liberties for the political class of the Lithuanian, of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania or Lithuania at that, at that time. Um, uh, those values, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, the personality is quite complex, but please believe me, it has nothing to do, to do with men, any any uh, uh, martyrological motives. It is a purely, you know, as you see, military guy. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, that is the stained glass uh, um, created in the interwar period, and you see two guys. This one is definitely not the same. Uh, it is the most ugly um, uh, medieval ruler you can have. Vitotas or Vitor the Great, really the Great, but with uh, his personality, you can make no sign at all. Uh, Saint Casimiros is this, and uh, um, as they are put together, uh, I believe it signifies a certain secularization of the personality of uh, Saint Casimiros when he becomes, in fact, in the context of, of Lithuanian nationalism, it becomes a sort of um, spiritual or religious ref reflection of, uh, of um, the secular power, the secular, secular ruler, which is really very worshipped during the interwar period. Vitotas the Great was the main figure of Lithuanian history, and I believe still is. Mm. Uh, the story develops along, uh, along the period of communism and uh, uh, in fact this idea of uh, St. Casimirus as sort of spiritual ideal, whatever it means, uh, survived uh, at that time in the Lithuanian Samizdat, uh, but those guys are not St. Casimirus. <coughs> Those are uh, people who actually produced a uh, uh, significant part of the Lithuanian summits that during communism, they are also persecuted by the Soviet authorities for, those are priests, 
uh, uh, for not only for producing some that, but for much, let's say, lighter activities like teaching kids for religion. So that's, uh, that's why they are here. Come on, wait. <laughs> uh, and with uh, their personality, I believe the idea of martyrdom in Lithuanian uh, ideology or in Lithuanian national memories comes out very, uh, very strongly as they themselves at certain point in the middle of 1980s were called martyrs for the fatherland and God. Uh, sorry, God and fatherland, okay? Reverse. But those two things were connected and because they spent some years in prison, they were called the martyrs. Uh, those pictures as you see here, this is, sorry, this is not very visible. Um, maybe th this is more readable. Uh, Reverend Alfonso Sfarinskas and Reverend uh, Sigita Stankiewicz, now an Archbishop of, of Kaunas Diocese. Uh, those pictures, as you probably can, if you ever have ever seen the Catholic typical signed picture, yes, that people have in their books or something, it is a sort of imitation, right? With the information, what is the sense or the the, what are the facts of their, of their suffering for God and the country. So those, uh, those pictures were, um, were uh, um, produced and disseminated among the believers uh, uh, quickly after the imprisonment of the two, uh, 1983 and 1986. Uh, that was the, the reaction to, to, their, to their imprisonment. Um, uh, at that time, at that time, um, those, who, uh, those who suffered for, for the nation and God or God and nation were um, not numerous or at least it was considered that they are exceptional, that they, are, they sacrifice themselves. During the period starting more or less at 1988, uh, in, Lithu in Lithuania there was a, an interesting uh, process, not, not exceptional I believe, of regaining the memory of the Stalinism, Stalinism victims. And in very Lithuanian case, it was very strongly saturated with uh, religious ideas. And uh, in fact, it overlapped with the uh, return of the church to the public sphere. So those pictures, in fact, uh, are to illustrate or to, to represent uh, this interconnection between suffering for the God and the country. Uh, this one, uh, this is the reburial of the, of the guerrilla war victims. Uh, Lithuanians fight it against Soviet up till 1949, 52, more or less. And those who, who uh, fell in this, uh, in this war on the side of of uh, Lithuanian nationalists, in most cases, didn't have uh, sort of um, normal funeral. So, if people knew when they are just uh, buried or or uh, or just thrown away, what what KGB used to do, um, uh, they they organized the very solemn reburials, and they were always with very strong religious. Uh, uh, religious uh, connotation, uh, not only um, in, in common terms that you r usually have priests with, with uh, all ceremonies, particularly funeral, but also on the ideological level. Uh, uh, on this background, I would like to show you the new blessed Bless Theophilus, Mat Theophilus Matulonius, uh, who was declared uh, blessed last year in uh, June, 
So uh, the beatification was a big, big event in Vilnius. Uh, uh, that's the picture, so-called canonical picture that represent him. He, has a, he had a very rich life. He li lived for 92 years. Uh, more or less 20 of them he spent in different sorts of imprisonments, lagers, and stuff like that. But uh, still, uh, I'm not going to read it because we don't have really time. But I'm just, uh, I have underlined those points of his uh, life who are really connected with uh, 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 any sort of Soviet persecution. So it is important part of his life but not uh, exhaustive in this respect. So I am trying to say that uh, his biography was a sort of selected or uh, some elements were stressed very strongly to show him this way, that he is first of all not only a martyr, but first of all a prisoner, okay? And he, uh, he died also uh, not in very clear circumstances, but most probably uh, killed by the KGB. Um, now, um, what between those two, St. Casimirus and uh, blessed Theophilus? Nothing. The idea of the hero saint um, uh, that is military or political uh, seems like uh, died more or less uh, up till the end of the 20th century. Uh, I mean, St. Casimirus as a Lithuanian patron was more or less forgotten. And uh, in fact, uh, he was um, no meek reflection of those, this great ruler, Vitotas the Great, while uh, uh, blessed Theophilus last year uh, seems to me that fits all to all together to those criteria that we know from from Czarnowski. First of all, uh, it seems that suffering became a value of itself in itself in the Lithuanian mentality, or at least in some narratives on, on Lithuanian history. Uh, so this canon of thinking about a nation as a victim that was produced at that period in 1988 during the emancipation from the Soviet Union, it's still valid. And uh, some scholars even speak about, historians uh, speak about self-victimization of Lithuania in, in this respect. So uh, the... the uh, mm, personality of blessed Theophilus uh, was definitely shaped for the worship toward this direction, to show him that he suffered, first of all. Uh, second, this motif of one of us was uh, very clearly taken by the uh, secular authorities. And I am, I'm going to quote just uh, the president of Lithuania, Dalia Grybowskaitė, and her speech, um, in the, uh, during, the, uh, during the ceremony of beatification, uh, she told uh, uh, that is the memory of our sufferings of deportations, uh, uh, um, uh, sacrifice and death. Uh, we all, all our people, all, we all went through, uh, through that and Theophilus is one of us exactly this way. So, in secular terms, he is regarded as um, a symbol of national suffering. And this, uh, I'm trying to, I choose this, this pictures from his beatification. Uh, that's the procession. Uh, those are, those kids are first person and the persons in this procession. The branch of palm symbolizes the martyrdom as you probably know, but next, uh, the, uh, the uh, military ceremonial expresses, first of all, um, this attachment to the nation. It is not militarization uh, in itself, 
uh, it is normally how the politicians or, or important uh, political or national uh, uh, um, activists are, are buried in this way. So um, what I was trying to say is that um, uh, after the communism, in fact, the process started, started during the communism, uh, um, Lithuanian uh, national memory in some its segments um, uh, rejected or has forgotten uh, heroic aspects of um, um, military fighting uh, uh, virtues and moved toward the sacrifice, the, the uh, suffering, the cult of victim, and that is with the participation of the church. The important thing is that this person is in fact in the process of, of uh, uh, now archbishop. He was in the process of uh, promoting uh, blessed Theophilus as, as, a, as a, uh, a blessed of the Catholic Church. And he is mostly the one who stressed his value as uh, his virtues as, as martyrs. Uh, let me just uh, say some very last thing uh, that is comment on the Pope's visit on, in Lithuania last month. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, the Pope Francis mentioned blessed Theophilus just once, or I, if I am diligent enough, if I was diligent enough to follow, I found just one mention. While Lithuanian bishops or officials uh, for several, several times, so this is certain disproportion. Second thing, um, uh, uh, Pope mentioned uh, and greeted Lithuanians with the 100 years of their independence but he actually only once mentioned or uh, considered the collective uh, suffering of the Lithuanian nation. Um, here he is bef uh, at, the, at the Museum of uh, Occupation and Freedom Fighters. It, 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 named, it, it is named right now. And mostly he was speaking about very universal uh, problem of totalitarianism and, and, and suffering. And last uh, but not least, that uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, in his, in his, uh, 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 in the, the accents and stress of, of his uh, speeches, of meetings, um, uh, he was even somehow well, criticized, he was criticized for not following the John Paul II, the, the former uh, Pope, who really stressed very much this value of national science and national tradition and national co uh, connection to Catholicism. So uh, my point is here that probably if we can see, if we will see the secularization of the national saint, it could may come from the very unexpected direction, from the official church itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, our next speaker is Professor Olga Hristaforova from the Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow. Uh, she is the director uh, of the Center for Topological and Semiotic uh, Folklore Studies in RSUH in Moscow and the professor at the Center for Social Anthropology in RSUH uh, and also a leading research fellow uh, in the School of Advanced Studies in the Humanities in Moscow and her <laughs> area of studies are social and cultural anthropology, folklore studies, oral history, visual anthropology and medical anthropology. Thank you very much. Yours, yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, um, let me thank the organizers of the conference for its uh, great honor and pleasure for me to participate in it. And uh, uh, some doubts. Uh, my paper, uh, 
In my paper, I will not discuss the canonization and sacralization of the past, but uh, rather uh, the demonization of the Soviet symbols and Soviet power in the eyes of all believers. Um, but, um, however, um, uh, uh, these people uh, can be uh, called uh, victims of the regime, so <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, uh, Soviet project of creating the new uh, human being, including the uh, construction of collective memory, which uh, was not only a legit legitimate ver version of the past, but also a container of folk culture values, and um, the ground uh, space for celebrating communist rituals. The project itself was rather uniform, but had multiple local incarnations that were determined mostly by ethnic and religious identity of local population. All believer communities of the Russian North shared symbols of the past, sites of memory and commemorating rituals with the rest of the country. Still, local perception of the communist regime and its symbols depends in this milieu on a variety of factors. First, a high literacy rate of deeply religious old believers, the erudite knowledge of Christian literature. Uh, second, um, a very critical attitude toward Soviet authorities, and third, local beliefs, witchcraft beliefs, uh, first of all. Uh, in my paper, I um, try to analyze the process of adaptation of the communist project to all believers, persistent religious and cultural tradition, and seeks to explain how communist symbols coexisted with hostile local attitudes to the power, Soviet power, and why did they even survive the collapse of the regime? Uh, um, in focus of my field research was um, the area uh, of Verkhokami, historic region near the sources of the Kama River on the border between Perm region and the Udmurtia Republic. Uh, where old believers, Bespapovci, uh, priestless old believers, uh, live, um, have uh, lived uh, since 17th century. This is the region. Uh, um, um, sorry. Uh, Perm region and Udmurtia. Uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, in this area lived about 30,000 uh, priestless old believers. They lived either in large villages or in small farms, will established social and religious ties between them. Many of these communities still exist in the region with an uh, estimated population of about 10,000. However, the number of purely religious communities, sabors, has decreased noticeably now they consist mostly of elderly people. You can see on um, the picture some of the people of the region. Uh, the communist regime was first established here um, about um, 100 years ago in 1880s, 1980, and met with strong resistance of the old believers. A peasant rebellion against the communists started he in the August of the 1980, but was brutally suppressed. He is the uh, communal grave of the uh, rural communists and Red Army soldiers who were uh, died, killed during the Peasant Rebellion. Uh, village Sepuch. Mm. Uh, The soldiers of the Red Army who were killed during the rebellion, as well as local, uh, locals who took part in the Soviet part of the rebellion, uh, soon became prominent heroes in the, region, in the regional official memory, which still dominates official discourse here. In the 1990s, they appeared several publications rehabilitating the insurgents in local media, but communist monuments and museums expositions are still in place. Uh, uh, from local museums. Uh, unofficial private narratives represent the events quite differently. They portray the rebellion peasants who were often fathers, grandfathers, uncles of the people whom I talk to as the heroes or other victims of the regime, while the Red Army soldiers as the invaders and the warriors of the Antichrist. 
In my paper, based on my interviews with local people in 1999, uh, 2016, I will all uh, analyze the perception of the communist symbols by the old believers of Irhakamia in the uh, 1920s, uh, 80s. I will try to, to explain first ideological framework that determined interpretation of Soviet symbols, pioneers die, pioneers octobris and consumal pins, and rituals as anti-Christian ones, and second, changes of uh, this interpretation through um, the 20th century. Uh, uh, communist kids and youth organization in the USSR were arranged according to the age of their respective Tajik groups. Seven, the, uh, seven, ten years old kids might join the ranks of little Octoberists, Aktibriata, the name commemorating October Revolution. Since about 10 years, they moved to pioneers, and since about 14, to young communists, to Komsomolce. Uh, first pioneers squads appeared in the USSR in 1922, uh, Octoberist uh, groups in 1923, in big cities. Uh, later, this organization reached the countryside. Uh, my, uh, my respondents born in the 1920s don't heard anything about Octoberists. Only few of them, mostly children of newcomers, joined the pioneer squads, but many younger uh, respondents, born in the 1940s, 50s, while having missed the October stage, entered the pioneers' ranks. ranks. Uh, children regarded pioneer status as a prestigious one. First, only those with high grades uh, were allowed to join, the others only later, and some were never adm admitted. Uh, not to become a pioneer was a shame. Uh, one of the uh, women said uh, she wanted to be like others, uh, and the uh, parents forbade her to join the pioneers, and she cried. Um, uh, another woman said, you are considered a hermit if you are not joined the pioneer organization. Uh, in the old believers' families, any participation in all these organizations was normally rejected. I will hang you with your tie, the father of an, uh, one um, of the respondents told her, having found out she joined the pioneers in the early uh, 50s. However, many kids just ignored their parents' disapproval. They put on the tie on their way to school and hid it out while going home. <laughs> of course, not all the um, uh, families had the same strong negative attitude. Some kids joined the pioneers in uh, 40s with tacit approval of their parents, while others could not do it even in early 80s. The older generation, even in the 60s, seriously called a pioneer tie, the Satan collar, the dark collar, the sheep joy. Uh, in the ends of red tie, as well as the pentagonal stars of octobrists or the Komsomol pin, they saw the re reflection of the hell's fire. Uh, when one of the respondents born in 1966, not having asked that his elders, uh, joined the Octoberists and came home with a star pinned to his shirt, his grandfather said, you pierced your heart through th uh, with this star. You should have it burned on your back. Uh, it's, um, mm, here we have an uh, interesting moment. It is a of typical motive of the old believers' rhetoric, of burning a sinful object or a sign of a sinner's body with allusion to the hell's fire. Another example, um, we often meet such judgments motivating various prohibition, in particular the ban of being photographed. Uh, as uh, one of the um, old uh, people uh, told, um, uh, the question was, are you allowed to be photographed? They do not allow it, religious leader. Uh, there is, it's written, of course, mom was still alive. She was reading a book, the prologos. 
in my opinion, it's very bad. I heard it like this, I heard it when I was little. Here, put this picture on this body, burn it on the body. If your body endure it, let's say it will not hurt, take pictures. Well, what it will be? Uh, another version of post-mortem punishment were possible. It was said that those who were a pioneer's die and um, in the afterlife would be throttled by a snake or a place where a badge was pinned, would be nibbled by a mouse or sucked by a toad. Where did these images come from? There are common place of the old believers' literary tradition. For instance, the tale of the sinful mother from the Russian version of the Speculum Mess, the Great Mirror, tells us about a monk who had a vision about her late mother sitting on a snake with a scorpion on her head, another snake winded around her neck and in her ears set fierce mouth, mice. Uh, thus, uh, she was punished for her lechery and addiction to embellishment. So the sight of affiliation of a godless organization or in the loyalty to Antichrist regime was perceived as a kind of embellishment. All believers regarded any kind of embellishment, for instance, jewelry as a certain invention aimed at seducing human beings. To use them was a serious sin subject to inevitable uh, punishment. A brooch was prohibited. All the thoughts would stick. This is, we see, a uh, pioneer's uh, uh, pin, and here, um, Todd, and pioneer's tie, and here, snake, red snake. Unclear, unclean priests here, and um, members of youth uh, communist organization. Uh, um, The motive uh, of burning is also very characteristic for the old believer tradition. It's worth mentioning that in Soviet culture, the images of fire and burning were, on contrary, very positive. For instance, a former school teacher on the picture, teacher of chemistry, who, in her own words, devoted all her life to anti-religious propaganda among children with the help of chemical experiments, proudly cited to me the words of a communist poet, Nazem Kihmet. If I don't burn, if you don't burn, if we don't burn, who will leave the darkness? But from the point of view of those whom she tried to enlighten, this burning could took place only in one particular place where they have uh, ne absolutely uh, no desire to go. Uh, other, obviously ideological and natural cultural practice associated with um, the new regime, like hair, hair cutting for girls and take photos uh, also were um, pro prohibited. These practices were closely associated with joining the communist youth organization. Uh, for cutting her braid, a girl might be severely punished. As the father heard of the call horse, told one of the, my respondent, uh, born in uh, 1926, uh, prohibiting her to join the pioneers, uh, he said, do not dare to cut your hair. If you come home without them, I won't let you in. On the other hand, taking part in families or communities' religious life led to penalties imposed by school or a pioneer's organization. Many informants told that teachers checked whether kids wear crosses under their clothes, so children had to take them off on the way to school or hid uh, them under the um, in the underwear. Those pioneers who with their families visited local graveyards on the with, with Sunday is a custom prescribed or publicly reproached at school. To be sure here, like a uh, family, the human factor determined a lot. Determined a lot. Many teachers were of local origin and treated religious traditions with indulgence or even sympathy. As a result of all this contradictory influence, several generations of Erhakami old believers who took off their crosses and put on their pioneer ties on their way to school and vice versa on their way home grew up in a constant position of double thinking. This way of serving both the God and the devil that they themselves so disliked facilitated the process of adaptation to the communist ideology, political and economic realities. 
as they put on, uh, as they put it, we had it all, we had it all um, simultaneously. We prayed and were among October's pioneers. Um, I, uh, I didn't take off my tie, but always wore a cross too. You're torn between the two. In the school, they tell you there is no God and home that he does exist. Some adults contributed to this cognitive dissonance in their children in order to compensate the adherence to the Soviet culture. One of my uh, in, uh, respondents born in um, 1922 never joined any youth organization and prohibited her children to do this either. However, they wanted to, and her son dared to disobey. The following conversation took place after that. I don't want to pray. I enrolled in pioneers, said uh, her son. Uh, do you have a mark on your forehead because of that? Go and pray. At this point, as, the in, uh, as she told me, um, uh, told me, her husband, the former soldiers of the Second World War and an atheist, interfered with a short stop it. Uh, that was enough, and permission not to pray for, for her son was granted. While the perception of the communist symbols was rooted in the old Christian literature tradition, opinions about personalities of communist or youth organization funcionari functionaries rested also uh, upon local mythological tradition, that's witchcraft beliefs. The old believers regarded being a communist as a mortal sin. Communists, like sorcerers, were not permitted to be buried according to the Christian ritual. Most communists refused confession on their deathbed, uh, which was considered as a sign of being a sorcerer. Uh, you, you can see here. Like, it, um, like a practitioner of black magic reads his her Bible, uh, a communist reads his, uh, his her um, scripture. Sorcerers, as a local people, believe often um, competed with each other, mocked one another, communists did the same. The damage done to the others returns to sorcerer and their <coughs> children. Similar uh, retaliation awaited the communists and their families. Local communist bosses, in, uh, as uh, respondents, respond, respondents told me, suffered from ill fortune. Both them and their children came to a bed and saw that all their families died out. An enrollment to communists, including youth organization, put a person in danger of uh, irregular death, an early one, accidental, without a confession. Um, mm, uh, we may interpret this motive as an allusion to God's punishment, yet another interpretation is also possible. All believers perceived communist training and even Soviet school education as an introduction to a secret and dangerous knowledge similar to witchcraft. Um, uh, that being said, in the last two decades, opinions about communists and Hakami have smoothed and are not so negative today. The opportunities of confession, absolution, entering a sobor and Christian funerals are open for them, as well as for alleged uh, witch. Uh, the attitude of the communists started to change after the Second World War. The war changed the status of the young generation that took an active part in fighting and metaphorically said whipped out the sin of being a communist in the eyes of the elders. On uh, the one hand, many locals joined the party on the fronts of the war. On the other, Komsomolan party members sometimes turned to Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Christian faith in the later day. So um, a kind of mutual adjustment of ideologies and practices happened that changes them both. Yes, we were sinners. Went through the consumal, that's it. That's were the rules. If you are not a member, you couldn't get a, anyway. Um, just one minute I have. Um, uh, uh, attitude to colhoses, to um, members of pa communist party changed, um, and um, it's interesting that 
um, it's important thing that all believers are quite neutral, neutral uh, when speaking about leaders of Communist Party or uh, the leaders of the Soviet state. Uh, as one of the lead religious leaders of uh, one of the Sobers set, uh, set the, um, Lenin Stalin is not anti uh, are not Antichrist. Nikon, Patriarch Nikon uh, the anti is the Antichrist. Um, uh, how to explain this contradiction? contradiction? Um, uh, first, in all believers' worldview, the place of uh, the Antichrist has been busy since the 17th century. Uh, no disorders or even horrors created by later public figures can compete with what Nikon had done. Um, some pictures about Nikon and uh, the Peter the Great as Antichrist and false prophet. Uh, another important thing um, that all believe um, it's a patriarchal character of this tradition. Local people explain the necessity of subordination to the outside rule by well-known evangelical quotas. There is no authority except that from God and render to Kesar the things that are Kesar's and to God the things that are God's. And um, uh, these principles became an indispensable part of all believers' speech practice that both reflects and forms the attitude to state authorities being model of and model for, as Clifford Geertz put it. And as a result, um, uh, um, this, uh, I'm, I'm finished. As a result, uh, um, local people, all believers from Hakami, do not wait for the apocalyptic prophecies to be fulfilled. From their childhood, they are accustomed to the thought that these prophecies have been fulfilling for centuries. The signs of the coming end of the wills um, started to appear long ago. Um, all the history of the old belief, including the 20th century, is a history of active adjustment of, uh, inst of its institutes and mental models um, to the environment of the apocalyptic world. Um, um, A mutual adjustment of the imposed communist project and local symbolic language took many decades, yet finally by the end of the Soviet epoch, when three or four generations in their entire life had seen no other reality than that we were surrounded by, the strong rejection of this reality was most everyday tensions mostly disappeared, and the early alienation itself became part of a collective memory on both family and communities levels. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and our last speaker uh, is Dr. Mom Chilmetodie from Sofia University, St. Clement uh, Okritsky. Uh, she is the author of several monographs uh, devoted to um, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church and the Communist State, to the Metropolitan Andre of New York, uh, and to the, um, the state security within the Communist State. She is the editor-in-chief uh, of the Christianity and Culture Journal, uh, and he uh, took part in the compilation of several uh, documentary collections published in the Bulgarian Dossier Commission, and he worked for several Bulgarian and international projects devoted to the communist past. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for all... Thanks a lot for the organization of this conference, I must say, because I think it's devoted to one very important topic, which in our time quite often is politicized and uh, <coughs> even quite much, much more oftener it became object of quite a lot of conspiracy theories. So it's good when we can discuss all the problems from, uh, from an academic point of view. Uh, and my topic, the topic that I choose to talk about, is about the state security files. As you can imagine, this is, uh, this is a problem, this is the most painful problem actually in the Bulgarian society, uh, and especially about uh, uh, state, state security files among the church, and especially among the church leadership, 
It's exactly uh, the most painful topic about the public appearance of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. Uh, and of course the question is, uh, because in Bulgaria the archives, the state security files, they were opened relatively late in 2012. All of them were opened, so especially about the church, so we can reconstruct the whole picture. Uh, and uh, uh, since then, initially I was thinking, I was hoping, not only me, a lot of other people, we were thinking that once the archives are open, the process of canonization of the mart martyrs would become easier. It became just the opposite. Uh, since the opening of the archives in 2012, uh, although we know that there were a lot of martyrs in Bulgarian Orthodox Church, none of them were cano was canonized. Uh, so it seems to me that the connection between the opening of the files, opening of the archives, and canonization of the martyrs, at least in short-term perspective, is negative. And I will try to explain why. Uh, first, I will start with short historical background about the history of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church during the communist period. Then I'll make a brief analysis of the situation in the 90s, and then I will show you the graph about the correlation between objects and agents within the synod of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church during the communist period, so we can make analysis, an analysis based, on, based on, on this uh, evidence. Um, so talking about the communist period, the situation in Bulgaria was quite similar to the one mentioned by my colleague from Romania, uh, uh, with one, of course, uh, important difference, and, and it is that the Bulgarian Orthodox Church uh, cannot be blamed for cooperating or, yeah, for cooperating with the Bulgarian pro-German government during the Second World War. Meaning that the Bulgarian Orthodox Church leadership especially, it was very active in the campaign against deportation of the Jews uh, from Bulgaria. So that uh, now two of the leaders from that period, then later on they became the first head of the, of the, of the Bulgarian Church during the communism and then the second head of the Bulgarian church during the communism, uh, they are honored as rightful people by, by, by the Jewish, uh, by the state of Israel. Uh, so uh, uh, in, the, in the first phase of the communism, the repression was very heavy. There was one metropolitan who was actually killed after a church liturgy in the courtyard of the, of, of, of the church, uh, metropolitan Boris of Nevrokop, so it seems to me as a very clear case of martyrdom. Uh, there were at least 10% of the Bulgarian priests, uh, parish priests were imprisoned and sent to concentration camps where they spent uh, different periods of time. And at least in the first two decades during the communist period, uh, at least all of the metropolitans were objects of the state security as you will see a little bit later. Uh, then in the second two decades in the communist period, the generation changed, of course, so uh, the, if there was a real resistance, it was soft resistance against the communist regime, uh, it was changed into a kind of, uh, uh, we can say, collaboration or at least coexistence between the church and the state. So when the regime collapsed in the early 90s, uh, the church was able to present itself as a victim, in general speaking, in general terms, as a victim of the communist regime. And then became the schism. The colleague of mine uh, mentioned it, the schism between the episcopate, the episcopate of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, meaning that it split into two parts. One part of the episcopate of the metropolitans, members of the synod of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, uh, claimed that uh, claimed themselves as being anti-communists, so they wanted the patriarch at that time to resign. Uh, so uh, the episcopate and the synod split into two. So they created a kind of alternative synod, so-called anti-communist. They created a kind of alternative synod, and uh, this schism continued till 2001, when finally they were uh, they were unified. At that time, you can imagine in the 90s, in the, these hot years of the political debate, uh, people were divided as well as the episcopate, and it was quite obvious that people who were anti-communist, they supported the anti-communist synod, if, if we can call it, uh, uh, simplified uh, uh, in this manner. 
And of course, the anti-communist Senate uh, accused the uh, patriarch at that time that he was elected uncanonically with the support of the Communist Party and, uh, and uh, that he was collaborator with, uh, uh, collaborator with the communist state. Um, and at that time, it is very important to note that at that time, uh, the, the archives, at least the state security archives, they were not opened. So everyone was talking whatever he wants. They were, for example, the so-called anti-communists, they were calling the patriarch at that time Colonel Maxim. Uh, there were a lot of rumors, but no facts. Uh, of course, a lot of conspiracy theories. But anyway, the most important thing is that division uh, division was very deep and very happy, it, uh, very, uh, very deep. Uh, it went not only in the episcopate, it went also to the, uh, among the believers. Uh, and uh, at that time also, there was a huge talk about canonization of martyrs, especially among the, let's say, anti-communist wing within the church. Uh, they insisted very much on canonization of the martyrs, they didn't have time to do it, uh, but still they started to collect a lot of recollections, a lot of uh, memories about uh, priests or uh, bishops who uh, suffered under the, uh, under the, communist, uh, under the communist regime. Um, so the church was unified. This unity, this term unity is very, I would say, dubious, if, if I can use this word. Uh, and then came the revelations. The revelation came very late in 2012, as I mentioned. Uh, and what happened? <coughs> Sorry, where is? So here you can see the correlation between agents and objects. Uh, actually, they opened the archives in 2012. It became clear that at that time, uh, 2012, 11 after, uh, out of 15 metropolitans at that time uh, worked as state security collaborators during the communism. So the shock was really great, uh, very deep. And then we were allowed to go back into the, uh, into the past, into the communist period. So after uh, looking into the archives of all the metropolitans in Bulgaria during the communist period, uh, uh, I made this graph. It is, it is not made, made by, by the commission, it is made by me, but I have checked all the names of all the metropolitans uh, in the communist period. So you can see quite well that in the early 50s, about 90% of the metropolitans in the Senate were objects of the state security, if you want victims of the communist regime. And of course, the percentage, the, the percentage was dropping gradually with years. And uh, uh, that initially there was only, in the early 50s, the early 50s there was only one collaborator, agent, agent of the state security in the Synod of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. But later on, especially during the 80s, the number uh, increased drastically. So that, which is one of the surprises, in the period after the end of communism, the number of state security agents were uh, higher than in any period during the communism uh, itself, as you can see, as you can see very well. Uh, so what, what those revelations said? They said several things. First, there were a lot of surprises, meaning the patriarch who was still alive at that time, Patriarch Maxim, uh, became clear that he was not collaborator with the state security. He was not informer to the state security. The other thing which, which is very important to me is that the leaders of the so-called anti-communist synod during the 90s, it became clear that they were the most active collaborators with the state security during the communist period. Uh, uh, some of them even because I can, I can tell you a lot of personal stories, but we don't have time for that. Uh, I mean, some of them with very painful things. Uh, and then what happened later, and I, will, uh, and I will finish with that, going back to the topic of the martyrdom and going back to the topic of, uh, of the memory. Uh, those revelations, they have changed everything. 
first, they made the top, the, they, they made the, uh, the conversation personal. Because among the metropolitans, there were people who collaborated with the state security, and of course, they have done something bad to other, for example, priests or other bishops. And we can, we can, we can trace this uh, based on the archives. Uh, then, uh, uh, the other thing to me very important is that uh, martyrdom could be used as a way, as a tool, let's say, for whitewashing of biographies. Why, for example, the anti-communist metropolitans in the 90s insisted very much on the cases of martyrdom? Because they wanted to present themselves as martyrs, as victims. Uh, if you want, uh, I, can, uh, I, can, I, can, I can tell a lot of names, but maybe uh, uh, in Bulgaria it's impossible anymore to be venerated simultaneously martyrs of the communist regime and collaborators with the communist regime. It seems to me that in Russia it is exactly this case because they, they are venerating their martyrs, which is, of course, they are martyrs, but at the same time, for example, a month ago I saw at the website of the Moscow Patriarchate that they were uh, honoring uh, Metropolitan Nikodim Rotov, Metropolitan of Leningrad, uh, who is well known that he was very well connected to the regime at that time. In Bulgaria, that's impossible. Uh, so, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, uh, opening of the archives for a short-term perspective, it seems to me, makes the canonization of the martyrs not very likely, because it is exactly those collaborators they have, that have to canonize the martyrs, which obviously, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to be done even publicly. So. Uh, opening of the archives, it seems that it hinders the process of canonization of the martyrs, but it also makes impossible whitewashing of biographies. This idea of the unity of the church, of the church being uh, in general victim or collaborator to the communist regime, uh, is impossible. It's person to person, and there are martyrs, but also there were collaborators. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and now is the time for comment commentaries. And the commentator is uh, Dr. Agata Shustova-Drelova from Slovak Academy of Science Sciences. Uh, she is the researcher uh, at the Institute of History in, in this uh, uh, academy in Slovakia. Uh, she obtained her PhD from the University of Exeter in England. Uh, and in her doctoral thesis, uh, she explored the cultural history of Catholic national nationalism in late socialist and early post-socialist Slovakia. Uh, so uh, please, your commentaries, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, of course, 10 minutes is far from enough to comment on each individual paper, so I will instead try to kill two birds with one stone and embed any criticism or compliments in a more wide-ranging uh, reflection about the current state of scholarship on religion and memory, and perhaps even more specifically on religious memory. Uh, also, uh, being a historian of religion, I could not help but use this opportunity to bring uh, in several insights from, from, from history of religion. In fact, I, I think that these papers and the theme of new martyrdom and politics of memory offers a great opportunity to think about the concept of religious memory and the possible insights we can get from history of religion. Uh, why? Uh, new martyrdom, I think, is, has been recently a very busy and a very crowded commemorative space. Uh, religious or religiously attuned narratives of the past involving claims to martyrdom have become increasingly prominent throughout the region from the, in a sense, purely religious cases, the persecution of churches uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and here, the Russian Orthodox Church, New Martyrdom, is a well-known case in point to the stories of national uh, sacrifice presented uh, at museums such as here in Warsaw, the Museum of the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, likewise, the study of New Martyrdom is a very vibrant field. 
Uh, the research is inspiringly innovative. It has been, to use the popular buzzword of late, interdisciplinary. Uh, it has also contributed to challenging the dominant narratives about the public role of religion, as has been already mentioned uh, by several speakers, uh, including Prof. Agadianan. Uh, and relatedly, uh, the relationship between religion and memory in late modernity. Uh, here I, of course, have in mind the narratives of secularization, anticipating the gradual decline of religion, but also those about uh, churches and their fate during uh, and after communism. Overall, I found uh, the present papers to be very much uh, part of this new wave of scholarship on religion and memory. Uh, these studies present the churches as internally diverse communities, which are home to and part of very diverse processes of memory making, uh, religious and non-religious. The studies have also challenged uh, the narratives dominating official religious memory, which are typical, typically a combination of, to use Bernard Giesen's terms, the narrative of triumph and narrative of trauma. These dominant stories are, uh, this uh, formerly dominant stories are stories of a unified victorious church leading the nation and courageously facing the communist tyrant, which is in fact the image that some churches often seek to maintain. Now these papers also challenge uh, some claimed continuities between communist and post-communist remembering. In Romania, as uh, Dr. Enake, uh, Enake describes, uh, the making of martyrs has been a turbulent process where we see clashes among different agendas, uh, religious, political, uh, national, transnational, and coming from elite as well as grassroots level. Uh, in Bulgaria, as uh, Dr. Metodiev uh, argued in his paper, the Orthodox Church struggles uh, to canonize new martyrs as the archives revealed that not only martyrs, but also collaborators were part of the church's history of the communism. Uh, Dr. Kozhenievska shows that religious martyrdom, which is, uh, if I understood you correctly, martyrdom for faith was, n was not popular among Catholics during uh, communism, and instead Lithuanian Catholics thought about martyrdom in, in more secular uh, terms, uh, in terms of national sacrifice. And among old believers, the suffering uh, during the, although going back to your paper, I think that uh, this was more prominent in the earlier version of your paper, and now uh, I think it was not so much about secular martyrdom as a combination of secular and, and uh, faith martyrdom, national, national sacrifice. Um, so going to, uh, to all believers, the suffering during the, the early years of communism does not prevent, uh, especially the younger generation, uh, from mixing religious and official memory. Uh, furthermore, I think that exploring new martyrdom and working with martyrdom as the main analytical category has proven very useful for developing the study of religion in the region in, in several aspects. Uh, for one, scholars no longer study religion as something separate from society, culture, politics, and in constant struggle with modern state, as had often been the case of uh, traditional ecclesiastical history. Indeed, even when they write about religious actors, they clearly see the churches as part and parcel of uh, their societies. Uh, as these papers show, martyrdom is a keynote uh, where var various mem memories, religious or those secular, uh, meet. The making of martyrs is part of not only religious, but also political life, and the two are in fact closely linked, as Dr. Enake has pointed out, when he spoke about the religious political communities forming around martyrs. Uh, politics and religion, political and religious memory commingle also in Lithuania, where making of a Catholic martyr played a crucial role in the legitimization of the newly independent state. And uh, this particular agenda has in fact uh, led to emphasizing some aspects of the light of, life of the martyr while underplaying others. Also, as Dr. Metodio has showed, uh, the construction of a religious memory cannot disregard the opening of the secret uh, police archives, and uh, indeed this event has had a significant influence on the making of this memory. In the case of old believers, the commingling, commingling of secular and religious is almost a natural part of life of generations coming of age under communism. And again, going back to Romania, 
uh, as Dr. Naka showed, the making of Maltese is closely related and sometimes compromised by political affiliations, past and present. It is also thanks to this commingling between religious and non-religious agendas that the current post-communist hierarchy seeks to make a saint that might surpass, surpass these conflicts and at the same time vindicate the church's reputation after years of uh, rubbing shoulders with the communist state. Um, in sum, uh, this approach, uh, which sees the making of martyrs as religious as well as political process, is very useful in being, in a sense, very down to earth. Uh, but I wonder whether there is not the risk that, that we might go a bit too far in the direction of politics, or perhaps too fast in, in this direction, while paying too little attention to, re to religion, and more specifically to faith whether in terms of tradition, theology, or lived religion. Studies of memory and religion, and I think it is also the case of the presented papers, typically demonstrate how the practice of remembering was either driven uh, by the ambition or more simply need to sustain communal bonds or consolidate political or ecclesiastical authority, and how it in turn helped to sustain these bonds and this authority. Yet, they do not seem to pay quite enough attention to the fact that these are also communities of faith. Um, what I'm suggesting is not so much uh, a change of angle, rather the lens through which we look at this memory waking. Um, I would like to conclude this commentary by sketching uh, why and how understanding martyrs as an integral part of living and thinking faith might be useful not only for the study of martyrdom, but more broadly, for the study of religion and memory. Uh, here I'm inspired uh, by not so recent mood within the discipline of history from explanation to a search for meaning and understanding. Uh, and this move uh, together with the demise of secularization narrative uh, and related critical reflection of its influence on the study of religion inspired some historians of religion to turn to taking faith and its individual meanings seriously as object of analysis. In more practical terms, uh, Brad Gregory, um, a historian of religion at uh, the Notre Dame University, suggests that um, our first question when studying history of religion, and in extension also religious memory, should be what did it mean to them? Uh, what did it mean to the individual believers? And applied to the case of new martyrdom, what did martyrdom mean to individual believers in the context of their faith? Uh, as a result, instead of looking at faith only in passing as a mere illustration of predefined conflicts, uh, I would suggest to look at faith in, in greater detail. It may turn out that faith has many interesting political, social, and cultural ramifications, and identifying them may add nuance to any analysis of making martyrs. Now, one way to go about examining the role of faith in making of religious memory is, and uh, here I'm inspired by Brian Porter Such and his work on Polish Catholicism, is to make a distinction between the sort of uh, theological core, the teaching and the tradition, uh, that is in this case, of course, the official definition of martyrdom on one hand, and the individual Catholics and their individual interpreta interpretations of faith and martyrdom on the other. Catholicism can be seen as a, as a sort of cultural framework that is being reconfigured, sustained, and recreated uh, by those who speak and act within it, but also uh, the core around which uh, these more complex plethora of different interpretations uh, uh, need to sort of circulate to still be considered uh, Catholic. What we get in the end may be an even more complex uh, plethora of different interpretations and even more nuanced understanding of interactions within the memory for, uh, field, both without and within the institutional boundaries of individual churches. Uh, having said that, I of course do not mean to suggest that the authors of, of these papers completely overlook faith. It, it is absolutely clear that uh, you are aware of the, of the fact that martyrdom is an important part of the Orthodox or Catholic tradition. Um, and despite the fact that your goal has not been to explore the relationship between faith and martyrdom, your, paper, uh, your papers, the objects of your analysis and some of your methods could be definitely used in such research. Uh, I found Dr. Enakes' example of, of, of the Ayut prison and the figures around it 
particularly in interesting in this case. And Dr. Christopher Roba's use of oral history can be a very useful way to get to the individual believers' interpretative frameworks. Also, Dr. Kozienewska point about the differences between uh, the approaches of John Paul II and Pope Francis are, I believe, much about the different meanings and understanding of faith. Uh, the very recent canonization of Oscar Romero uh, by Francis, I think, illustrates these differences quite well. Uh, the process of canonization was not the fastest during, uh, during John Paul II uh, pontificate. Um, uh, in some, I believe that looking in greater detail at how martyrdom forms, just as it is in term formed by the individual meanings of faith, and that, then how it is performed in lived religion, in everyday practices, is definitely a path worth exploring. It may not be uh, it may not be only a useful endeavor on its own, but may also add nuance to studies which want to solely focus on, on the politi political ramifications of, of religious memory. It is clear that the days of, of um, uh, the sort of unquestioned rule of secularization narrative in humanities and social sciences is over, but I wonder whether taking faith a little more seriously uh, is uh, not a very important step, step in overcoming its legacies in the study of religion and memory. And uh, yeah, thank you, that here I stop, thanks. And now is the time for uh, discussion, for questions. Uh, perhaps. Thank you very much, just a few questions, one uh, to uh, Georgi. Uh, <clears throat> why actually uh, canonization is not taking place, finally? It's not, we, we know why it's, it's not in, in Bulgaria, but what, 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 is, it, is it the same thing or not? And uh, second, you mentioned that in 2007 there was this project to make interdenominational materiology, yes. right? Was, uh, is really interdenominational, I, I mean, the Greek Catholics were included there, they, the, the, the Protestants, the Hungarians, or I don't know, the Transylvanians, and so the, uh, how, how, how much, you know, un, unity was there? And uh, uh, the question to Katarzyna, is somebody trying to canonize without us? Without us? Was it? No. There, there is no kind of popular uh, 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 grassroots movement or like a part of some, some activist who who are trying to do that? Or is it still a part of the big national narrative? It, or is suffering really more important than the memory of the great Lithuania that used to be in 14th century or whatever? Yeah. And uh, the last question is to Olga. Uh, so uh, did I uh, uh, understand you correctly that, that uh, the rejection of jewelry, hair cutting, and the pioneer's ties is actually the same route. So there is no specific, you know, the Bolsheviks as a sorcerer and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is a kind of a continuation rather the, of, of the image of those who, are, who they are distancing from the imperial church, the imperial orthodox church rather than or everything else Mandan, which is connected to that. Rather, there is, uh, there is no uh, specific you know, meaning of the uh, Soviet and communist in this, or is it, is it not the case? So that's the question. Uh, so we start with answers or we collect questions? Collect. We collect questions, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first of all, thank you very much for presentation and my uh, question for all participants, and it's quite uh, easy. Uh, what do you think, um, why the people or elite or the churches wanting to have the new martyrs and new signs, and why they are not happy with old one? Thank you. I have a specific question from Momchil. Um, during the, the 1980s, the, um, the rebirth of nation process that took place in Bulgaria, did the church have any role in that, or was it all from the secular state authorities? No more questions. So perhaps we will start with answers. 
Uh, you have one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does it work? Work. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, I have just very brief question uh, concerning old believers, uh, like ethnographer to ethnographer. Old believers uh, live also in uh, uh, Belarus and Lithuania, and. Um, in fact, I don't know about Belarus, it was longer, but in Lithuania they welcomed Soviet authorities when they came. So uh, um, the view is uh, quite, uh, I would say, different. Um, uh, whether you, I, don't, I would like to ask whether you know anything about that, about uh, any sort of comparison between Russian Belarusian or Russian Lithuanian old believers. It would be very mm -hmm. interesting as the Soviet authorities or communism came there in a, a bit different shape. Thank you. So, no more Should questions, start, yes. so perhaps. Uh, there is one more. Ah, oh, one more, uh -huh, okay. And you have a very short question to Mountain, Meta uh, Mountain Metodiev. Uh, these archives were open very late. Uh, they, there were, uh, there were, uh, they were a revelation, but how reliable are those archives? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps we'll start with answers. So, uh, very fast, uh, my, the second question. Uh, uh, the project was initiated, as I said, by the, our German foundation, St. Gerhard. All the churches were involved initially in this project, but uh, soon after the start of the project, uh, there were misunderstandings between the Orthodox Church and the Greek Catholic Church. The Greek Catholic uh, Church position was clear uh, in the, uh, uh, the liquidation of the Greek Catholic Church, uh, in the liquidation of the Greek Catholic Church were, were involved both the state and the Orthodox Church. So the Orthodox Church didn't, have, didn't accept this, uh, this position and uh, the Greek Catholic Church representative withdrew from the project. So in these uh, books, uh, uh, you can, we can find biographies uh, from Orthodox Church, from Lutheran Church, from Protestant Church and so on, but uh, no Greek Catholics, yes. I was involved in the project, I know all, this, uh, all the story. And uh, regarding my first questions, because I want to make the link with uh, my Bulgarian colleague, in the case of um, Romanian Orthodox hierarchy, no one expresses desire to be canonized. We, uh, the hierarchy of Orthodox Church hadn't uh, such, uh, such claims. We are talking about uh, the people who are in prison, only about the people who will spend uh, years in prison for their faith, but here, particularly case of Romania, we have huge problems. The presence of uh, this movement, legionary movement, uh, many scholars consider it uh, to be a mostly fundamentalistic mov movement or uh, that uh, fasc fascist movement. So um, uh, it's a huge debate uh, to, uh, this, uh, the, uh, this year in uh, Romania about uh, the problem uh, underlined here, if um, uh, many of these people uh, in prison left their political conviction and uh, adopt uh, a Christian way of life. So it's a huge debate. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a canon in the, in the tradition, Orthodox tradition, as you said. The person who left uh, the common life to enter the monachism is uh, forgiven by uh, his past sins. It's not necessary, we forgot uh, his sins from, uh, in, from, uh, from his common life. But another person used to say, we can't uh, discuss like this in theological terms, we must do the, uh, this discussion in political terms. So yes, you're right, uh, we must uh, focus on this aspect of Christianity about this theological, uh, perspective of this issue, but there are also other people who used to say, no, this is it's not uh, correct, we must focus on this political aspect, and uh, they treat the problem in a political key. So, uh, uh, in fact, there is, as I mentioned, this one person, Axenia Boca, yeah. and his, files, his, uh, his files is in uh, 
uh, on the table of the Holy Synod, and we'll see if this uh, uh, next year will be canonized, and perhaps will be an example to open another another files to canonize another person, and to answer to your questions. No, they have no problem. They have in Romania. They have problem with the new martyrs. They have any problem with the old saints because uh, after revolution, the Holy Synod canonized tens of saints starting from the late antiquity until the 19th century, but no one from the communist uh, period. So it's not problem. Old is good. <laughs> My, it's quite bad. Sorry. Thank you. I'll try to be short. Uh, first about the question about the new martyrs. Why, why do we need them? Uh, it, because they suffered. That's, that's the short question, the short answer. Uh, meaning uh, they suffered a lot, some of them a lot. Others suffered not that much, but again, they were isolated, marginalized, uh, ostracized from the society. Uh, and then they were forgotten. Uh, whether they will be canonized as a martyr sufficiently and venerated as martyrs, uh, we can dispute about each individual case. Uh, but I'm very sorry for our church that it hadn't made a list or a kind of organizational uh, attempt to, uh, to collect all archives information that is available about the people who suffered. Uh, uh, without going into details and personal stories, just because they, they suffered. That's, that's, that's the, the answer. Uh, about the revival process, very important question. Uh, I haven't researched it, I must, uh, uh, I must say. Uh, so it's more, more, more of a hypothesis what I'm going to answer. It seems to me that uh, uh, the patriarch at that time, he was a very cautious person, so he was not... Uh, don't get me wrong, he was not a martyr. He collaborated with the regime, but not with the state security. Uh, but he knew very well that he is part of a historical, uh, that he's part of history and that the regime changes. Uh, unlike other people that, that didn't know that. Uh, so I don't think that he uh, publicly endorsed, supported revival process. I have never heard of that and I don't have information about that. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that uh, another metropolitans, important and influential people in the Orthodox Church, did support it. Uh, so uh, I cannot blame the church, I can blame individual people. Uh, and again, I don't know details and I, have haven't, uh, I haven't researched it, so uh, it, it could be some nuances here. Uh, and about how reliable are the archives? Uh, uh, so about the state security archives, of course, always exists such a, such a, such a question. Uh, but uh, how to say, I, I have read, I, I can say, all state archives related to, uh, to the history of the church during the communism. Then I have uh, gone to the provincial, to the regional archives in Bulgaria, so I, I have checked a lot of regional archives. Uh, and then I went to read the state security archives. Uh, in the state security archives, there are a lot of unreliable information, a lot of gossip, a lot of yellow things, a lot of, uh, uh, how to say, monks doing something with, with women, as you can imagine. And when you are reading those stuff, uh, uh, quite often it's clear that it's completely impossible what, what it is uh, said there. Uh, uh, but uh, after reading that much of, of, of the archives, uh, I pretend to some extent that I can distinguish what is reliable and what is not. Uh, certainly there are people reading those archives that are going with some bombastic uh, conclusions, but I'm trying to be very cautious. Uh, and finally about the collaborators, certainly among them uh, there are different cases there. Some of them were very active, uh, some of them were not active, some of, the, of them we can claim that even they were uh, somewhere between victim and collaborator. Uh, I presented these statistics uh, without names uh, just to show you the trend and not that much uh, to, 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 to dispute personal biographies, which is another, another story.
thank you. Uh, I'll try to, to answer this question specifically on Lithuania, but first of all, I would like to, to thank our commentator uh, for, uh, for all her comments, but particularly um, for the, um, for the uh, encouragement. I had some cases that um, uh, the canonization or beatification process started, but they were somehow stuck or they don't develop or nothing happens or they were not started just because uh, uh, there was no cult, meaning that um, it is nothing but the, the official the official churches attempt to make a saint, or on the other hand, there is a sort of uh, uh, belief among people about one on another person to be saint, but it, he or she sometimes does not fit really to what, um, what is the image of, of the saint uh, in more theological uh, terms. And uh, it encourages me also to have a look, to have a look at them at the saints that are not uh, uh, priests or nuns, and I think it is sort of significant that all those uh, martyrs, new martyrs we speak here about, are mostly priests, uh, not even nuns. So that's for, uh, for reaction to the, to the comment, very, very, as I say, encouraging. I'll try to answer the story of Vitotas the Great. Uh, it is a crazy story, really, if you, uh, happened to know uh, Lithuania was baptized the last in the Europe. It was uh, 1387. Uh, Vitotas the Great died at 1430. And as I said, most ugly medieval ruler with all possible of sexual abuses, cruelty, cheating, not uh, keeping promises and stuff like that. At the same time, at the same time, he had really um, contributed much to the Christianization of Lithuania and made really a great uh, um, state, let's say, right? And was quite a effective um, a military leader. So even, uh, even in terms of uh, uh, medieval, uh, medieval uh, concepts, uh, in the 15th century, he had no chance to be saint, although he probably fitted to, into this model of the uh, uh, king baptizer, okay, like Saint Stephen or, uh, or Saint Venceslas, but it didn't work at that time. It was already too, too late for that. Other ideals mattered. Um, uh, it was, in fact, what I'm saying was, is not my, my, my study or knowledge. Uh, there is a study in English by Giedre Mitskunaite making a great ruler, so she explains this. Now, for very, for very now, um, uh, in fact, the only people who would promote Vitautas as a sort of hero or saint were Lithuanian pagans, but it is very tiny group of people close to, um, I would say historical reconstruction, but they believe they, they just uh, practice and, uh, and faith into this old uh, um, uh, native vernacular religion of the, of the old Lithuanians. So maybe this way for, for, for church, Vitautas has no chances. Um, as far as this question, very important and general question is, of, is concerned, uh, why do we need um, new martyrdom? For very Lithuanian case, I, I may say that, that Lithuanians have no martyrs at all. So new are ones are at the same time uh, old ones, and uh, that's why. Uh, taking it more seriously, I believe that uh, Lithuanian nationalism and I guess several other nationalisms in our, in our re region uh, as produced by priests or people with theological formation or education, um, I, uh, it is, in, I mean, ideological language of, of Lithuanian nationalism is infected by the uh, uh, religious concepts. And that's why it is so important in Lithuania, not only in, in, in religious terms, in, in ecclesiastical terms, but also on political or national level. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, my answer to Alexander. Uh, for me, it uh, was a surprise to find out that all, all believers um, uh, uh, took the uh, P uh, pioneers being uh, Octoberist being as a uh, not as a symbol of uh, evil power, but all, uh, uh, also like secular jewelry. But um, then I understand it's uh, quite obvious. Uh, two models for us science of sin, science of impurity, and science of luxury. For them, there was one model. Uh, Toads, snakes, scorpions equally adorned the bad um, imperial priests and the uh, woman who loved to decorate herself with necklaces, earrings. That's all one model. Um, and uh, um, the second question, uh, from about power, um, f f your question about yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, I think, um, in fact, uh, in the Urals lived. Uh, there were no serfdom, and they lived uh, free and rich peasant. And uh, Soviet power for them was very, very bad. Very badly they. Um, uh, perceived it. But there is, of course, a difference between um, in, in, um, uh, how they perceive the local and external authorities. The state power, um, it's uh, very far and um, it's okay. Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, uh, far away. And local, local authorities, it depends how they behave with the people, local people. So, the difference. Um, so uh, the question about why we need new martyrs, um, I can speak for from what I know about the, the Catholic Church, which is what I focus on in my my research. Uh, I think it might have something to do with the uh, the spirit of uh, the Second Vatican Council, for example, which called for this sort of new evangelization, which would answer, in a sense, in a, in a more in a better way to the needs. Um, uh, of uh, of of uh, the current times, you know, which called for um, uh, really um, observing the signs of times, and then, uh, in a sense, uh, making the uh, evangelization a little more um, a little more accurate uh, for 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 the new challenges, um, and. Um, and, and this would would go especially for the sort of elite level for for the canonization processes. Um, as far as the grassroots level, um, but to an extent, this may also apply to to the elite. Um, I think uh, it might be useful to consider one thing as far as martyrdom is concerned. Uh, we've spoken about how um, you know sometimes difficult, protracted, and, and even tortures the proce process of making new saints um, and martyrs, maybe. But I think that in some respects, uh, making a martyr can, can simplify things. You know, we've got these very complicated memories of persecution, suffering. Uh, often, uh, we don't know the names of the victims. And I think that making a martyr can, in a sense, simplify uh, memorialization, commemorating of, 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 of these very diverse uh, victims. So yeah, that would. Okay, uh, thank you very much.